I used to watch you uh, when you come on. I think Oprah doing your different uh, discussions around sex, and I was like, she's amazing. This lady's great. <laughs> so it's so great to uh, get to talk to you today. You too. So, yeah. So I guess I will um, start off, you know, and just let you talk a little bit about like why you got into doing what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just some of your philosophies around the way you coach and, and provide therapy to your patients. And, and some of the ways I coach what? And provide therapy, you know, like uh, your, your okay. methodology. Right. So the way that I, you don't, I mean, you're welcome to leave, but you don't have to feel free to stay right. Okay. Um, so the way that I really got into it, you know, at this point in my career, I've had enough longitude that I've thought about this or been asked this a couple of times throughout my career, but definitely more recently. And I'm realizing that it, everything in my career has come from a, a place of just frustration and anger at, at, um, at inadequacies or insufficiencies, you know, around, mostly around women. Mm -hmm. um, but like, so I, I set out to be a couples therapist, which I did, and I am first and foremost a relationship therapist. But when I was in graduate school, um, I would go to my supervisors, you know, when you have cases and they would, and I would say, well, this couple, you know, just brought up, has these sexual issues. What do I do? Cause that's what you would do. You would bring the supervisor or your professors, the issue, they'd tell you how to deal with it. You'd write clinical notes. They'd tell you how to deal with that. And they were all looking at me like I was a pervert or a weirdo that <clears throat> these, you know, what are you asking these couples? And most of the time I wasn't even asking them anything they were bringing it up and I was wondering what was happening that no one else was getting, you know, cause no one else was getting these questions. And then that's when I really started to connect with the fact that I had just been raised to be, you know, really comfortable with sex. It wasn't a taboo thing in my family. In fact, it was maybe a little bit too much overexposure cause my dad was a surrealist artist and you know, it was the seventies. And so I was really comfortable. And I think because of that comfort, people were bringing their issues to me. It didn't even occur to me that that was weird. And then I got pissed that people saw that, it, that my clinical supervisors didn't, couldn't help me and thought it was weird. And it seemed weird to me that you could be a couples therapist and not address sex. And so I decided to get more training and I kind of put together my own program. I did a master's in human sexuality and then got my clinical training. And then I went back and got a PhD in health education and therapy focused on human sexuality. And then I went to um, a fellowship uh, in sex therapy. So, and then I ended up doing my dissertation on what predicts for a clinician's willingness to address sexual concerns. So that was like the beginning. I was pissed. I got trained and then I started doing sex therapy and then I became famous for that. Mm -hmm. But really I'm a couples therapist who just, you know, no, I I'm glad that you started that conversation because I think it's things that people don't feel comfortable talking about. And a lot of that does come from how they are raised and how mm -hmm. it's introduced into their lives and how it's sometimes a taboo subject, but yet it's also a causal effect of why so many relationships become unhinged or unglued. So I think it's great that you lead into something that was just natural for you to do and that you have people that you could help through being more vocal and, and honest and having straightforward conversations about it. Yeah, and then that led me to get pissed that women's sexual health wasn't being understood and the physiology and anatomy wasn't understood. And that became apparent when Viagra came out and there were all these options for men and none for women. And so then I, so it's all, every aspect of my career has been like, what the hell? You know, okay, I'm gonna address this. So in terms of the work that I do, it's really, um, I work with couples and individuals around building better love lives, better relationships. Um, a lot around, you know, it's all intertwined with worth and how you learn to love, how you learn to love and be loved. And, um, you know, it became apparent to me pretty early in my life, certainly, but definitely in my career that, uh, you know, I'm just here to help people learn to love and be loved better. And I'm really good at it. <laughs> so yeah, that's, good. that's my thing. And I work with people, uh, you know, I do some individual work. I have my radio show nightly in 50 plus markets around the country it's a syndicated radio show and it's also live streaming in a podcast that's called uncovered radio um 
And I love that because I can act, you know, get, <clears throat> give a, access to advice to people in Arkansas and Wyoming and all over right. the place. Where people don't yeah. always want to have those conversations. Yeah. <clears throat> or can or have access to it or know who to ask. And then um, I do intensive retreats, which I really love to do, where couples and individuals sort of leave their lives behind for three to five days and really focus on their relationship. So I, I work with couples and individuals in a whole bunch of therapeutic ways, more distant and close up. Okay. Um, and I guess my other, you know, I have a couple questions for you that I think are burning questions that people always ask me because I do some relationship coaching too. Mm-hmm. You know, you settle into a routine. It's just normal for things to get, you know, there's boredom with uh, stability of a relationship. Yeah. And boredom isn't always a bad thing, but people kind of expect that it will always go like this and relationships kind of go like <laughs> this, mm-hmm. right? So when people settle into their routines, like how do you suggest that they spice up their sex lives? Well, I, that's really the most common question I get in every group, right? How do we <clears throat> spice it up? And I think the question itself has is very normal and it's a classic, you know, it's a great question, but it's also a, um, a misled question because for a couple of reasons, first of all, and I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but just biologically and neuro, neurologic, neurologically, you know, we go through first an infatuation stage when everything is new and you're not really committed and you're still learning a lot about each other and the dopamine centers of the brain are firing like crazy when they look at people's brains who are newly in love. And that's the same addiction center that Coke addicts and everything, you know, that lights up. So you're in this really intense period. And then anywhere from three months to three years, depending on how quickly you get committed, and how much time you spend together, you move into the attachment phase. And that's when people sort of say boring. But part of the reason it seems boring is one, societal, because we have this kind of idealized, we're measuring ourselves against media images of, you know, from Greta Garbo on to today, you know, these images of what passion and love, and it is really intoxicating. It's like, you know, a heroin addict is all, you know, they call it chasing the zebra. You know, you're always sort of trying to get back to that first high, right? <laughs> it's like yeah. those repeat, those serial monogamous because they- Well, those I call uh, love addicts, you right. know, infatuation addicts, really, because they think when they get beyond the infatuation stage that they're no longer in love. But that's not really, that's infatuation. That's not love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't even believe in love at first sight. I believe in lust at first sight and love at first insight. You know, you have that first, that first connection, that first physical attraction, but it's really love is about something much deeper. So spicing it up. Okay. I can give you 365 positions role plays, fantasies to act out. And in a year to a year and a half, assuming you tried some of them a couple of times, you would be wanting more. Mm -hmm. Um, And what we're really looking for, and it took me many years in my career to really figure this out, what we're really looking for is intensity. And that intensity comes from going deeper, not wider. You know, And, and where we're misled, with the question and with the intention behind the question is in thinking that the secret to a great relationship is in just keeping making, which is partly true. I mean, look, I love all of that. Those are all tools, role plays, fantasies, toys, positions. Like I'm, I've written eight books on the topic. I love it. But that's not where your true sexual satisfaction and excitement and drive what we're really looking for is intensity, which really comes from vulnerability, openness, um, creating a spiritual element to your sexual experience, um, and a kind of vulnerability and intense exposure and intimacy. That's what really creates what we're trying to create with the spice temporarily, because yeah. the spice is just like a adrenaline kick. Right. It's not really what we're wanting to feel. It's a, it's a simile of what we're wanting to feel, if that makes sense. Right, but the, emo- like the emotional connection you build with someone is what builds deeper intimacy. In a- and the risks you take and the degree to which you expose your 
heart and your vulnerability. And, you know, I have a chapter in my latest book, uh, Quantum Love, called Quantum Sex. And I'm actually working on, um, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether it's going to be a book or a course, but on a t that specifically on the sex piece, because that was one of obviously the most popular chapters, but it's really about um, approaching sex as one of the most sacred and spiritual, profound mind body experiences you can have, you know, and the degree to which you can feel it and move with it and move the energy of that sexual arousal and share it with someone else and how much greater that can make the arousal physiologically, not to mention the emotional and intellectual experience of it. So that's really at this point, you know, I can easily with my eyes closed, give you 80 new positions to try. But for me, in terms of my work with people, you know, that's what's most exciting for me to teach people these days. Yeah, and I, you, you, I like the saying where you said love at first insight. I think that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And I was going to say to you, you know, it, it, the, the scary thing right now is there's a lot of shows out there like called, love, you know, Love at First Sight and other yeah. themes that kind of send you the message that love is a lot easier than what it entails. So I think, you know, people are, are challenged right now with dating and knowing when they're compatible with people and if something's sustainable or not. So I think you've been in this, you know, business a long time of, you know, working with couples. You know, what do you think is the biggest downfall of a relationship not working from what you've observed? Oh I have so many thoughts on that one, but I would say, um, well, first of all, you know, I'm passionate and always saying that I feel like any couple who is planning to get married or really make a long-term commitment, should, including having a child together, should have couples therapy, not just pre-cana therapy, but couples therapy to just make sure, because most of us haven't been raised in really with really healthy relationships modeled for us. And so to learn how to communicate, how to get your needs met, how, you know, how to find common ground sexually, parenting, religiously, economically, you know, how to be on the same page, how to resolve conflict in a healthy way, how to fight for the relationship and not just to win, like all of these skill sets that were never really taught explicitly and only a very few of us learn it by having it modeled for us. So we really need that, all of us. Um, I would say in terms of the biggest downfall, you know, when I, when people say like, how do I know if this one is the one, you know, or how do I, what kind of litmus should I be using? You know, certainly you have to have the attraction. I think where women often go wrong is that we settle for someone who's amazing in every possible way, but we're not attracted to. So you, you know, will be more likely to do that than guys will. Um, because it's so, such a huge part of our relationship and sexual satisfaction is that connection. But ultimately, you have to be physically attracted. You have to have that chemistry. You also have to have, you know, shared vision of the future, shared sort of attitudes towards sex, money, children, and religion. Um, but you also, most, most important that I don't think enough people look at is that you have to have someone who has enough emotional intelligence and self-awareness that they're open to learning. You know, if I, like, I would put that on the top three things that you have to have, because if that person isn't willing to be open to learning and, and receive constructive feedback and be able to move with that and expand with that and grow with that, you're screwed in a long-term relationship because you're constantly having to work through things, you know, and our natural inclination, as you alluded to, is to just take our hands off the wheel of the relationship. And that's normal. The key is in realizing before you veered off the road so far that you're in the cornfields and having the mutual trust and capacity and, and personal awareness to kind of reboot on a regular basis, which every relationship needs to do. And I actually just joined forces, I'm really excited about it, and it's relevant to your question with this company called We Have Chemistry. Have you heard about them? I have heard a little bit about them. Okay. Well, so um, they are, uh, so they do um, a DNA test where they look at different variables it started actually as a dating site and they were matching people according to their DNA. 
And that worked, but then they started getting all of these requests and really the main interest was like, how can we use this information to build a better relationship? So that's where I came in. So I created the social emotional alignment assessment. That's like a 50 item questionnaire that's really asking about how align, how much in alignment you and your partner each are, each of you fill it out around sex, around um, con you know, communication around adventurousness, like lifestyle, just different variables that would like predict for that are the, con the most common areas of conflict or discord or dissatisfaction in, in, a, in a relationship. And then they're looking at the DNA elements. And the goal is not to say to the couple, you know, you guys are screwed, but to say, because no couple is ever screwed. I mean, I really think as long as both of you are willing to work at it, there's no relationship that can't be great. Mm -hmm. um, but it shows you the areas where you're gonna most likely struggle already with conflict or will struggle with conflict and or discord or disconnect and how to feed that or build that or address that. And um, I'm really excited about that because I think that's really one of, that's a whole new future to counseling and coaching and providing really customized resources to couples and with artificial intelligence and all the ways that we can really target that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited about that. I'm their chief love coordinator. Nice. I like that title. Not a good title. So I'm uh, proud that the love, the love uh, experts have some official yeah, titles. <laughs> have some official titles. Yeah. And I just had one more question that, you know, comes up commonly with the people that, you know, I coach because people normally come to you for help when they're in pain. Right. So, you know, how do you know, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do you know if um, after an affair that is unrepairable and like what time frame do you use, you know, to, to make that decision? So I was curious about your thoughts. on that. Well, I mean, I, there's a whole process I take people through when it comes to repair after the affair, you know, um, and I can walk you through that in a general sense. I don't think, but to answer your question, I don't think that it's a timing thing. I think if it's a question of, so there's several variables that people tend to ask about this. One is, you know, how do we work through this? And I can answer that for you if you want. The second is when will, or how, you know, how long does it take to really get over this? And it depends on, several factors one how bad it was was it a one night stand or was it like a three year love affair you know um the degree of the betrayal how quickly that person is willing to let go of the other person take responsibility how much they're both willing to work on because both of them have a responsibility in the dance they were doing together even if you know the one of you that got cheated on it's not at all your fault so to speak there are issues in the relationship and you don't want to take that person back or even continue to invest in the relationship if they you know because i think the biggest catch for people is they're like well that you know they said like i'm having trouble getting over it and i'll say well what did what happened afterwards well he said you know he would he feels horrible about it he, he doesn't know why he did it and he's so sorry and he loves me so much and it'll never happen again and i'm like well that's not enough right. you know that's not nearly enough like he's or she, almost be like an action plan <laughs> right so the action plan is no further contact with the affair and an open book to all of the, your passwords and phones and everything else and understanding depending on how bad it was and how and if it's happened in the past that for quite some time you're going to have to really be vigilant about being where you say you're going to be doing what you say you're going to do being an open book to your partner letting them know if it's, if if uh, contact was attempted by the affair and how you denied it you know being having a little bit of a leash on you you know in the short term um, and then the person that was cheated on really understanding that in addition to you know like I'll have a 10 minute rule where you're allowed as the victim to vent throw emotional darts ask questions but then the rest of the time really has to be spent on building connection you know and really rebuilding trust and uh, what so many couples fall into the trap of is just conflict, conflict, reminding the other person all the time of how horrible they are and no room for, you know, and no couple, I think, can successfully repair after an affair without the help of a 
of a coach or a therapist because it's so loaded for us and it's really a process of getting to the bottom of what, you know, I wouldn't take anyone back who cheated unless they were willing, actively willing to participate in couples therapy and willing to look at why, what led them to behave this way, either inside themselves or in the relationship and take responsibility for it. And the person that was cheated on at some point has to take responsibility eventually for pieces in the relationship that might have been their part in the equation, even though it's still not their fault it happened, they had a role to play. So it's a process that is almost impossible to navigate through yourself. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think that's practical advice and we coach similarly. I don't think there's a time frame, but I do think there's a set of actions that have to happen and really honest, straightforward conversations. And then there's a point where you have to let it go to move forward in a way um, to rebuild that relationship. And then my last question, um, you came from an open household from what you said with your dad where, you know, sex wasn't taboo. You got, you know, it was kind of put out there a little bit more, but a lot of people don't grow up in that environment. So say a couple gets caught having sex and their kids witness, hear, or see something, what is the best way for a parent to explain that to them if say they're like a 10 year old or 12 year old? Well, I mean, I have a whole book, which I love uh, this one called talking to your kids about sex, turning the talk into a conversation for life. And I talk about it a lot, all of this kind of stuff, but this is what we would call a teachable moment, right? So the bottom line, and this is a mistake a lot of parents make, is, is that your kids need to know that you have passion between you, that you have an intimate life, that you even have a sex life. They even can know that you're having sex. They just don't need to know the details. They should not know the details. They shouldn't be walking in on it. They shouldn't be hearing it, you know? But knowing that you're having it or maybe suspecting when you come, you know, when your door is closed on a late Sunday morning that, oh, mom and dad, you know, it's fine. That's actually good for them because you're a model of what a loving relationship looks like and feels like. So I think that's something that a lot of parents think, oh, no, my kid, you know, I would never want my kid to even think that we might be having sex. It's not a big deal. It's good for them to know that. But if they walk in, I mean, first of all, it's another you know, it's a reminder that all parents should have a lock on their door mm -hmm. and even, you know, that way and a monitor, even if your kids are older and you're worried about that, you know, you can even say to them, mom, you know, I have, I, when my kids were younger, they knew, you know, we had mom and dad's need private time. They didn't know we were having sex, but I would be like, okay, we're going to go have private time for a couple of hours, which meant don't disturb us. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, but we have the monitor, one-way monitor on, so we can hear if they're burning the house down or anything else. Yeah. I mean, so, so there's that, but then also, um, if they do walk in, just say, you know, depending on their age, so if it's 10-year-old, that's different than what you'd say to a four-year-old, but a 10-year-old hopefully already knows the basics of puberty and baby making, so to speak. And if you haven't told them, then it's a great opportunity to explain that to them and also explain, you know, how sex is fundamentally an expression of deep intimacy and connection and the most magical gift that we can share with someone else. And it's the way that two grown ups, when they really love each other, um, you know, what you would say to a kid who didn't know about sex is when two people love each other and are, you know, and you insert your own values. And my family is when, when you're both grown ups and you really care about each other and you only want to be with each other. And she says yes. Then you hug and touch each other in a really special way that only people in those kinds of relationships do. And it's a really beautiful way of loving each other. And that's what you walked in on. Do you have any questions? And usually they're like, well, you know, no. Or, well, what were you doing? Or, you know, and if they're older and they kind of know what sex is, you say, look, I'm sorry you walked in. I should have put a lock on the door. Do you have any questions? This is normal right. and not like a big deal. Yeah, I like what you say. It's a way to open up dialogue and educate yeah. and, and have a teachable moment. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Can you tell people where to find you and then just where if they want to learn more about We Have Chemistry, they could go to look and- Yeah, definitely follow me. I'm always posting on 
all platforms at Dr. Laura Berman. Um, and if they go to my website, drlauraberman.com, they can find out, they can link into the radio and the radio show podcast if it's not being carried in their neighborhood. Um, they can also get my free program, which I love, Seven Days to Jumpstart Your Sex Life. So every day they get written content and a video sort of guiding, whether you're in a relationship or not. Um, and they can learn, I have an upcoming uh, weekend workshop. You should come if you want. Um, called Quant is I'm doing a quantum love weekend at this beautiful uh, retreat center called 1440 Multiversity. Um, that's the weekend of September 13th, okay. and you can find a link to that at the top of drlauraberman.com. Um, and we have chemistry is just we have chemistry.com, um, and it's right there. You sign up. It's really easy. Um, you take your little cheek swabs, you fill out your SEA, so you get your SEA and your DNA report. All right. And I, you know, I think that's a great concept that we have chemistry and I hope people will go check that out and also check out Dr. Laura Berman. She is great at what she does. She's been doing this for a long time and has just great, real, relatable, <laughs> usable, practical advice. So thank you so much today for your time. It's my pleasure.